Okay, so let's do this. Um, yeah, yeah, well, great stuff on um, on the certificate, the, the DIN spec stuff, all that. Um, good, <laughs> good progress. So, how, what's the latest on that? I mean, the latest, latest on what? Well, what regarding DIN spec and w where you're going with it, because for us, it's um, once again, as I mentioned, it's a great thing that we're getting some clarity of what open source means. I wanted to go into um, the possibility of starting to introduce the concepts of the ent open enterprise, mm -hmm. that idea, which is really like solving for the last frontier of, of human economics, which is distribution, right? Um, but how we maybe use your model to, you know, what, what, what we can learn from it and obviously continue forward. It seems like there's a lot of very interesting stuff happening with respect to that consciousness that collaborative product development could actually be real um and we are and just to let you know we are planning a major next move in a um what we call extreme enterprise did i mention that in my email maybe not upstream enterprise distributive enterprise but upstream is, is Ex no extreme term. extreme mm -hmm. like extreme manufacturing um, yeah but the idea that um, you know, just to kind of tell you the kind of mental framework of coming into this, so far, I think, well, I think it's agreed that hardware has not solved for the last step of product development, open hardware. And um, you've got a lot of crappy stuff out there that's not ever finished because the open source method, uh, at least in our experience, we've never solved people showing up that question that of getting enough people to show up to take it take a process to full completion to what um, what a real product means right mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's something that we're solving for and so hence that's the goal of the extreme enterprise concept so we're saying let's do a highly architected event uh, where we vet vet the people coming to it but basically a hackathon kind of like a like a startup camp thing but very very explicitly architected for getting enough people to show up and having a real product come out the other side of that mm -hmm. because ultimately i think we have to solve the issue of there's a corporation you know they've got million dollar budgets for product development they take a year and a team of 10 to 100 people and they develop a product um so i think we can do better faster cheaper better faster stronger and actually, uh, I, I must point out this one thing that why I think it's possible. I mean, there's this open source trap that we have. Uh, I actually wrote about it on a wiki, the open source trap. I call it the idea that, you know, some... And I think the CNC router is a prime, prime candidate of this. It's like, how many <laughs> hundreds or thousands of routers have there been and not a, with not a single product, right? So altogether, mm -hmm. you've got years and cumulative tens maybe hundreds of years of human development costing many millions of dollars collectively and never a product mm -hmm. you know the, the next person comes in either the documentation is missing or they you know they don't collaborate and they think they can do better without listening to anyone else and altogether the amount of effort and cost trans transcends the the amount that a simple corporation in a private setting would do they just fund it and get it done within a million bucks or something <coughs> And then um, they have a real product. So, so right now, open source hardware is very, very expensive. It's not. We haven't solved for that part. But anyway, that's that's the kind of mindset I, I'm really exploring these days. And the point being, we are going to plan on a well-publicized, funded event where you have money to prototype and to prepare for this, to just get enough people to show up and people with the right skill sets to show up, based on an ethical. Uh, it's really an ethical thing. It's like we're saying this product will be open to anybody. So this kind of mm -hmm. transcends the model of a corporation where I think a corporation would have a hard time pulling together an event like that unless they completely absorb the open open principles, which does not exist right now. Everyone's pretty much proprietary and you get the patents and all that. So, so I think there's a chance to so show something completely different um, and something that... It can be a transition to the next economy. So that's you know high goals, but we got to do an experiment on this. So we're planning on probably like within six months to a year from now to host an event and called an extreme enterprise event. It would be like a weekend, 24 hours, 2,000 mm -hmm. people, 
between I'm saying between 500 and 2,000 people. It will have to be remote. That's kind of how we're thinking about it. And right now we're thinking the idea of a house, an affordable, a fifty thousand dollar house, thousand square foot house, hundred square meter house. Oh, cool! Yeah. <laughs> so guaranteed, people will show up for this. Absolutely, we can make it hyper modular, like we did with Open Building Institute. So we've got. I mean, there's prior art to how you can do modular low cost housing, but that's a problem well worth solving. And many people will show up. So let's see if we can architect an event. So basically, yes, let's try this where we show a very, very clear example. There's all this effort that has been produced with the absolute open source intent and product. Everything is abs I mean, radically, just just true. Not no, no fake here. Nothing fake. This is all authentic, open source, distributed enterprise. So, yeah, well, that's that's my my intro. Okay, that, that's a good bridge. Um, okay, to start with, um, the house. Um, there are a few initiatives that I know that are ah. working on exactly that. So uh, okay. it would be great to, to build on something that has been done. They can investigate and okay. send you the references. Uh, okay. I have a, let me show you a page on the wiki called Open. Maybe you can actually. Ah, sorry. Yeah, it dropped out. Sorry, wrong, wrong tab. <laughs> um, let me show you. I, I am aware of four open housing. So open house. House. Projects. Oh, let me just take a look at it into, in my log. There's definitely some good prior prior art on it. Open, open source house projects. Take a look at this link. What I have so far. Let's see what you can add to it. Um, take a look at that. Um, the Austrian house. Austrian house project. Who is that? Um, with the, um, that was, I think, BB House or something. Uh, I heard about it from uh, Franz Narada. Mm -hmm. Do you know Franz? Uh, Open Land Lab or something? Uh, actually, that I mean, Open Land Lab is not the guys who did it. It's another group. I, that's what I thought too. Open Land Lab was behind it. They're not. They're they're just. Uh, I, I I don't know what role they have in there, uh, but it's not them. Hmm. Okay, well, I found Vivi House. I just shared the link in the chat, and I'm in contact with another group in Germany. Yeah, I can I can look this up. Yeah. Oh, I, I will send it's, it afterwards or add it in the wiki. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's some. I could probably pull it up somewhere from France or some, some old emails. But yeah, um, what any other particular decent projects from Germany or anything else um, regarding housing? Nope. Okay. Um, but coming back to the original question, what's what's up next? Yeah. So we have this demo, and now um, it's time to enforce it. So we are building a community of reviewers that then would check the hardware designs out there and create a list, so a central repository of real open source hardware. And this is to facilitate design reuse, basically, of production-ready hardware. So what I've seen a lot is that manufacturers um, don't want to build open source hardware because they think it's either crappy or not completely documented or they're not sure about liability and yep. and those kind of things. As production is not the big issue, the development costs are the issues in the business model. Production is actually easy. So anyone likes to produce a screw, um, screws or whatever. So when, when there's a free design, there shouldn't be a, a big threshold to, to build it in the end. So um, uh, we've done some work regarding um, solving this liability um, question about it. And I'm running a guideline about that. So that is easy to understand. So people don't need to read through legal code in their okay. specific country, but just like get a general idea how that works. OK. Um, yeah. And we are building a graph database to connect these open source hardware modules. I had a few weeks ago a chat with um, a guy in the US who wanted to build a ventilator for this COVID-19 thing and did a quick search for open source hardware ventilators and found about 20 different designs that yeah. 
have not been collaborating so 20 individual designs so a huge amount of development work that has been done uh, side by side um yeah and also no big modularity of the design itself they distribute the whole machine and not like this is the basic frame this is the power supplies so this that and so you can um, interchange these modules so with this um graph database we try to solve exactly that that you find modules like in, in software you find modules for your specific domain and you also see um, the interface, so in, like in software, the API, how these modules communicate and how you put them together. Um, yeah, and then with the um, related metadata that you would need for manufacturing, so tolerances, surface finishing, and that stuff. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, tell me, first of all, are you, uh, what do you do for a living full time? Um, do you know, uh, you mean how I earn my money? Yeah. Um, so um, within the Steenspec project, that was funded by the um, Standardization Institute. We won a competition. So I was, I employed myself out of the organization. And uh, then some guys wrote a huge um, proposal to the European Union to build up the um, ICT infrastructure for source hardware. That is this uh, that contains this graph database that I just mentioned. So I'm now employed in the research institute that does exactly that project. What's the research institute? It's uh, I can I can send you a link. It's Fraunhofer. But, okay, uh, yeah. um, they are usually not that open, mm -hmm. but um, within this organization, there's a department which is kind of free. And yeah, I can I can work pretty openly there. So we are officially allowed to share everything that we do um, with the general public under free license and as we can do so i can also work with my private linux laptop and not with this windows stuff and i can also work with externs so with the community nice uh where's Fraunhofer? is that in berlin um yeah berlin okay yep nice um and tell me maybe just back up a little bit to obviously germany stuff um is is there? This seems to be good concerted effort. On, I, for example, saw the open hardware loom by Oliver. Are you uh, mm -hmm. closely working with them, or um, not so much anymore? I did at the beginning, but then um, my projects blew up, so I was m much much more occupied with my stuff, and now we are working more parallel. Um, mm. So yeah, but I know them. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, so where do we go? Um, what are your thoughts? I mean, so so about this tool chain degeneracy stuff. I mean, what are your thoughts on it? On the, you know, like one common project that, you know, like for example, the Fab Labs. Like, it would be a great suggestion if they actually made it a project to okay, open source one machine after the other, so you have the full open source microfactory spec out there that people are using uniform tools. Um, but part of it is defining, uh, defining that specification. What what that is, and that would be an, actually an interesting project. Uh, I did notice a little bit on the open know-how, and first of all, how does open know-how relate to Fraunhofer? Um, um, not at all, just over me, because I'm part of the group, I'm also part of the Fraunhofer. Okay, uh, I saw some writing on an open know-how page where it was about, okay, let's talk about standards for the machines. Mm -hmm. um, are you involved in that stuff, or who's who's um, about No, that? I, I joined the first meetings, and um, the same one that wrote the first version of the Open Know How standard is now working on this machine standard. And I didn't really like the version one because there's a simply structure missing. It's just a list of um, interesting information, so discoverability standard, but it's hard to build upon it. So who's, um, who's yeah. doing that? Who's working on a machine standard? Um, it's mainly Tom Bartley, so the one that uh, developed this standards repo um, platform. So it's um, standards repo is the um, the Git based platform that they use to write this standard. So it's meant for people that want to write on on standardization um, without getting familiar with Git, um, which is a good idea. But the whole platform was proprietary and is yet having a vendor lock in. So it's impossible to export the source of the standard 
and, and those are some main reasons why we don't want to continue with this. Um, yeah. Oh, well, he does this as his business model. You don't want to continue with this. Who's who, when you say you? Who's you? Um, the working group um, of Open Know How, basically. So we are now assessing further and other platforms to use okay. aside from Stenos Repo, and which will be GitLab, I guess. Yep. Uh, who's the person again? So you're saying Tom? Tom who? To Tom Bartley. Maybe I can find a link somewhere. Bartley. So Stenis he's the Repo. one that's got. The not the proprietary route, or is he working on the GitLab one? Um, he's working on the proprietary one. So okay, that is him. Yeah. Well, he's he's definitely a good guy, but not maybe not the one for this project. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And tell me, uh, I noticed you said you had to politic a little bit to get the standard as a download, really downloadable <laughs> open source thing. How, how, tell me more about that. That's um, cute. Well, a few, um, a f a two or three years ago, there was a, a major change in um, um, uh, uh, people in the in the standardization institute. So from the president down to some uh, department leads, people changed, and hence the mindset. So it's much more open. They, they tended to be quite allied and a little arrogant in, in the past. Yeah. And uh, now they were open to fresh new ideas and noticed that standardization itself has to change. And a year afterwards, we came along and told them about open source and everyone liked it. So we did a lot of lobby work personally with everyone that we met inside this institute. And it's not like you can just walk in. So I needed to know people to get in. And, uh, <laughs> And now the the interest uh, the interest within the institution doubled in the last year, and now people are pushing the topic even without me. So I'm now getting um, access to higher class conferences where I myself could never apply for, as um, we only have one standardization institute in in Germany, which is also playing an important role in um, Europe and international standardization. So they act sort of like a think tank for industry um, in Germany. So have a um, good relation to the to the government. So um, over that way, I now try to um, act like a, do lobbying on a, on a governance level for, for open source hardware. But this will be rather at the end of the year. And you say conferences, uh, what kind of conferences? So there's one about digitalization and another one about circular economy. Um, especially with COVID-19, there have uh, there has been a surprising interest towards circular economy and mm -hmm. how digital manufacturing can work to um, diversify the um, the supply chains that we have. Mm -hmm. Europe doesn't build anything; China builds the stuff. So when the supply chains crash, um, we we cannot act basically the same applies for services and it's totally intransparent and now with COVID it, it crushed and also um, for climate change and all these things there's a huge need for new solutions and industry is simply not prepared for that and open source hardware gives a very nice all-in-one solution so that's why people get interested about it nice nice okay um so let's see what's so what's on the agenda for today. What else? What else are, do we want to cover? <laughs> so we have so much to talk about. Um, yeah. I'd also like to know um, how is your community working in the U.S. So what's the dynamic? How are you organized? I, I'm. I, yeah. I don't know. Well, so as a nonprofit organization, it's a high turnover thing. So myself and Katarina are full time, pretty much on on the facility here. We've got thirty acres as the headquarters here. I'm here in a CD go home right now. Uh, have you seen the CD go home on online? Mm -hmm. Nope. Um, this is the actual the, the modular house that we built in five days with fifty people. So this is the extreme manufacturing, the swarm build kind of stuff. Uh, but that's that's the seed home. That's that's where we are. So so the learnings for the house project would be based on a modular construction. That this was kind of like the highlight of um, like the latest of our builds ever using modular construction. But uh, 
as far as the organization itself, it's tur high turnover. It's like nobody sticks around. And the problem we're so trying to solve for is people doing this as a livelihood, right? Mm -hmm. So right now we're, we've got the 3D printers that are out as products and we're doing steam camps and workshops and that's enough to bootstrap fund us. But we want to basically, I think we're ready to replicate that in different locations. So we're actually starting a explicit effort where we're starting chapters. So a one year immersion and then we're start, we're getting people to start chapters in different locations, doing the same stuff. So that means uh, making printers, doing the education workshops, other things. Um, but the idea there is, we worked out some pretty good production ergonomics, production engineering on a printer. We can do like build two two printers per person per day, is our figure, mm -hmm. which is very competitive. I mean, I, Prusa does yeah. like one third like. I think two or four times less than that. Well, like if you look at per person per day, they're they're like one half or something, or maybe one. We do like two, so we're definitely very competitive on that. And of course, you gotta talk about quality control and all that. But the idea is spend one week in a month doing production, revenue generating activity, and then you can contribute the rest of it to further research and development because the plan is still 2028 is the finishing of the global village construction set we're about one-third done we've done a mm. lot of prototyping but there's much more to go and we recognize now that there's the whole next level which is if you talk about enterprise you know that's mm -hmm. the whole next level and that's that's what we're getting into right now but the idea is uh, one-year immersion training uh, you end up with a small micro factory where you can produce your printers and have an experimental cnc torch table and filament maker system so that we're pushing that forward as um, those those things are very important. Like we we did we do have a lot of the builds of the other machines and the houses. Those could be developed into business models, right? But the three D printer that's the easiest thing right now to do that we can generate revenue with. Plus that that leads to making parts for other things like parts for the larger mm -hmm. uh, machines like the CNC torch table or tracks for the tractors like rubber tracks. I mean that's we want to do all of that including printing four by eight foot panels for the houses themselves. I mean, using recycled filament, like that's part of the deal. Um, but we're starting with that. The idea is one, so in the, in the replication program of starting OSC chapters, you would incorporate an official branch. You do one week of production and the rest is R&D. So like 50% directly on collaborative with a greater team. And then like one week of flex time, you can say where you work on whatever you think is most important for the open source ecology project to get to the finish line. But after 2028, we're looking at, so if we develop the low cost ways to, to build infrastructures and micro civilizations, then we can replicate that worldwide as all kinds of operations from, from sustainable agriculture to micro factories to full OSC campuses. Like the, the chapters part is where the people are getting onboarded, but the, the bigger part of that is starting an actual facility like we have here so you've got buildings you've got a micro factory you've got agriculture you've got nature circular economies basically the getting to the furthest concept which is basically advanced civilization from dirt and twigs using appropriate open source technology mm -hmm. so that's that's the way we're looking at it as the chapters will that'll be the next growth state okay actually start an actual campus because right now for the chapter you would have to have like a hundred square meter micro factory but then if you want to go further with that the longer term plan is to replicate uh, basically these points of light that serve to rebuild the local economies basically circular economies and um, along the creation of the open source economy so the next major frontier is solving for the enterprise question that's why i brought up the extreme enterprise aspect because we still don't we don't have an organization yet i mean the, the th thing about turnover that's been a uh, constant issue our budget over the last decade was like 1.3 million dollars altogether so we're just kind of putting most of that into prototyping things and not really staff uh, just a lot of prototyping and a lot of turnover of people so this is where we're saying okay let's get people in a much more committed fashion do the immersion training as the route to do that for the OSC chapters um, that's that's kind of the essence of where we are organizationally does that answer mm -hmm. the question 
Um, yeah, kind of. Um, and it brings um, me back to the point, the tools that you mentioned. Um, so I had a meeting earlier today about um, some pub lab in, in also in Germany in Hamburg, mm. and they want to create a prototype for a fab lab. So rather space, um, how which which tools the fab lab would need to produce open source hardware. So the tools itself should be um, open source as well. And uh, so it depends on the yeah. on the hardware that you want to produce. Um, and that is within your scope of your uh, maybe end users or customers. Um, so that is what you need. Um, in your case, you, you um, focus a lot on on hands-on stuff and specifically well the global innovation, uh, the global um, British construction set. So that is especially interesting for um, for uh, development collaboration. Have you thought um, co um, about collaboration with uh, charities or um, yeah, all those organizations, Engineers Without Borders and stuff? Yeah, sure. But I mean, we I, I've never been able to convince anybody of the full vision thing. Like, uh, mm -hmm. ran into, presented at the Fab Labs, the Fab Academy. There was one guy, for example, Dan Meyer, who we just ran into, who runs a Fab Lab in in Chicago that we're talking about collaboration but I mean yeah I mean we've rubbed shoulders with a lot of things like this but a lot of times it's like there are definitely barriers to to collaboration in terms mm -hmm. of um, it's very rare to find somebody who wants to say okay we're just gonna work on a bigger problem because we can do more together that's kind mm -hmm. of how I approach people and just don't, don't get a lot of takers like for example if you talk about the open source microfactory uh, you know, I briefly mentioned that to Neil Gershenfeld at a TED conference, and he's like, oh, yeah, we already have it. <laughs> yeah, really? Yeah. Well, no, I mean, so, so, so for various reasons, the collaborative literacy is what I actually point to. Like, people think that we might have it, or they don't know if we have it, but we don't have it. We don't have an open source microfactory infrastructure. People don't know what that means. People don't understand the, the digital fabrication thing that you can do just about anything in a local micro factory that promise is a decade old nobody's delivered it yet and uh you know we we coined a term like rep lab the open source fab lab years ago but right now we're just going very slowly again to do exactly that up to induction furnaces and making metal and precision mm -hmm. machining um all of that in a small small micro factory on a scale of like 400 square meters up to making your own steel all of that um, but the way it rolls out for us right now, we've got the universal access system that we've built up to 50, so far we've done up to 50 millimeter rod size, which is good enough for heavy machines. So we're basically getting ready, okay, we've got the printer, now we can do the torch table slash router, and then we can do heavy machining. So basically, we can readily get into a CNC screw machine using the same kind of a design system. So that's very modular. It's uh, so, in fact, for the 3D printer right now, I'm already started sketching out the the open source screw machine, which would basically would be a big ch lathe chuck with automatic feed and then few heads, uh, all based on a universal axis. Uh, it's, no, that's pretty cool. I mean, it's oh. it's amazing. That's that's going to be good. That's that's uh, we'll see how quickly we can get to it. But right now, it's getting the 3D printer business off the ground. And getting the chapters off the ground so we actually have people to work on this the time it requires to do this uh, as we experiment with the extreme uh, enterprise event because if we succeed with that then we have created a model for rapid product development uh, but you're asking about the collaborations it just doesn't happen i mean it's like i i mean i i try to talk talk about this to everybody so far it's like the closest was like maybe getting funded by Shuttleworth Foundation for a couple of years, um, but I didn't get the third year there because uh, they said I'm not making any results happen. Um, mm. Basically, because it's like it, I mean it takes time, and um, we hired some people before, but the collaborative part—how do you actually collaborate effectively without fear? That's the that's the hard part. Let me give you a great mm. example. Um, so why uh, and that's a that's a live question to discuss i mean let's let's solve this so there's a list of product ready open hardware projects right 
So mm -hmm. why has the distributive enterprise concept, the idea that now you can teach someone else to do that, why hasn't this taken off a little more? In other words, save the next guy and going through all that business development stuff and actually teach people how to do that enterprise. That's what we do with the, the distributive enterprise concept. You can buy our printer. You can buy production of our printer. If you want to start a business making the, the printers that we do right now, we're, we're going to teach you. But nobody does it. Recently, I ran into this. I don't know if you ever had this, which is a perfect example. I just got a response from the guy today. Um, so the, have you heard of Ringo Phone? No. Nope. Or Maker Phone? Yeah, Maker Phone. Yeah, Maker Phone. It turned into Ringo Phone. Okay, so I emailed the guy. Wow, this is amazing. A phone, a working phone. 3G, 4G, mm -hmm. uh, based on a simple Arduino that you can make yourself. Absolutely amazing. So I'm excited. I emailed the guy. It's like, okay, can you guys... Um, uh, what's up with this? And they basically turned it into a product with custom boards that you can no longer replicate. <laughs> and that's what I mean. So I emailed them and said, hey guys, can you, I mean, in your campaign, you say, you know, DIY phone for the people. Uh, can you open source the blueprints so we can actually do that as a simple thing with a simple CNC circuit? You can go into even making your own little boards like the little Arduino board and other components using a simple CNC circuit mill and 3D printing. Most amazing thing. That would be like the most amazing workshop for education and practical. Like I would use this phone like since I'm into that kind of culture. But that definitely has a large appeal and large market. And they're like, no, nah, no way. We're not going to share that with you. It's we, There is essentially no business interest for us in that, in the email that, that I got today. It's like... Uh, that's a cultural so, thing, I guess. So, so what we're saying here is there's um, the project that actually lends itself to open source production engineering, which can be replicated widely around the world with very simple tools. The only two, pro two products that I know of right now that you can do that with are our two 3D printers. We use completely off-the-shelf parts and very simple uh, fabrication tool chains. Uh, and a 3D printer prints more parts for the 3D printer. But I mean, show me another product that you can readily go in and 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 say, yeah, start an enterprise doing that, so you can get livelihood from the open source products. It's a no brainer. It, this is the next economy because it's going to be you pretty much have eliminated all the product R and D costs through a collaborative effort. But mm -hmm. so far, I have not been able to convince anybody, maybe except of one person. Um, who truly gets the business side of that and thinks this is absolutely the next economy. Um, it's actually my mentor. Uh, I get mentored by a guy who does marketing, a mainstream marketing guy, and he completely gets it. And he says, wow, this is the next revolution. But you cannot explain this concept that, okay, so the Ringo phone, guys, I told him the case I made is like, look, if we're making these, that's just going to drive business for you, even if you have your non-DIY version. And they definitely don't see it. They don't see the value in that. But basically, mm -hmm. the common perception out there is that we cannot grow the pie when we work together. Everything stops at, you know, you do have open source projects, but I don't think many people are aware of the potential of the economic distribution that part has not been delivered and that's why i wanted to uh so we're going to get a new website for our actually our products and make it a website where we're actually advertising we're actually making known the concept of distributive enterprise we're thinking of calling it something like the open source everything store where you can post your stuff if you are willing to open source your production engineering and business models mm -hmm. and that i'm very excited about that um so we're going to That's start that. and I'm going to go wild talking to all the people. So your list that you're compiling, that's good. But basically the invitation is very simple. Let's collaborate. Then say the pro, you know, one project, all the projects become part of an ecosystem. One project could be even an Arduino that then we can use in our printers or a stepper driver, like the TB6600 that I mentioned to you, uh, the larger stepper driver. 
uh, that actually the guys from the Fab Lab, they have made an open source version. So we put that, we can use that for our CNC torch table. So basically you would have a, a product ecosystem where you can use the parts in other machines or you have machines there that make other machines. So it's a whole ecosystem and that thing just builds and explodes. I do mm -hmm. believe that's the next Amazon. I mean, Amazon's going to transition into this uh, mm -hmm. in the next 10, 20 years um, if we don't beat them to it. But um, that's the idea. But the thing is, the consciousness of that model is so low. So it's like you have to really strip through all the nonsense and BS of how the economic system works right now to be able to comprehend that, wow, there's a possibility of abundance. And from first principles, of course, that's, if you're a physicist, you, well, if you understand basic physics, like there's way more energy that we have that comes to the earth than we use today, right? So there's no case for like scarcity that, oh, we can't transform dirt and twigs into advanced civilization because there's not enough energy. No, there's plenty of energy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but society has, is very much trapped in, uh, I would say that 200 years of industrial inertia since the industrial revolution and of course more history when we were primitive and fighting for survival so we're still at that level psychologically and that's mm -hmm. the biggest uh, obstacle in <laughs> in this journey here but we're definitely going to make steps toward towards that with open source everything store with extreme enterprise experiment and i think the open know-how stuff that's trying to organize all the open modules um I think that conscious, like you're saying with the COVID, the COVID definitely pushed this forward to people talking about circular economies and maybe open source micro factories. And work collaboratively and work on, on common um, issues that the world has. Yeah. So Very everyone simple. needs a solution and it should be free for everyone. Yeah. I mean, um, we may need 30 million ventilators for India because of math. And we will may need them by October. So yeah. this raises the question: Who does it? So who will build up these immense of um, fabrication capacities just for that, and later um, for it come down again? Don't know. And so is it one company, one huge monopoly, or is it a bunch of companies? Do the replacement parts uh, match together? And who does the service? Who does the updates? Because there is this ongoing research on COVID-19 yeah. and all this stuff. What happens to all these ventilators afterwards? So yeah. um, with, that with that specific case, uh, we have like uh, an example case for any issue of humanity. So I'm kind of surprised why a collaboration doesn't happen in domains where this is highly needed, especially in um, development collaboration. Well, I've been working for um, an organize an agency that does that. Um, they they really want to um, build local ecosystems and markets where they act in order to avoid new bottlenecks, and um, that has been inspiring work. They they did um, the Ascotech. Oh, let me let me share your link uh, here. The Ascotech that is a sort of um, a toolbox to hold seminars about anything can be something mechanical mainly electronic stuff can be i saw one guy who was teach with that box about uh, business models and how to organize an enterprise and then founded its own enterprise so it's a it's a knowledge suitcase basically so you can do prototyping anywhere you don't you actually even we don't need electricity to do that to to um because there are solar cells inside and, and stuff like that so that was very interesting and um, organizations got interested in that because that's a whole new approach about how impact can double and multiply after you leave the project. So what happens with all your, your deliverables afterwards? Uh, is um, this Open con Culture Agency, is that, who is that? That's, uh, who is that? That's um, Rogue Agency, actually. Open Culture Agency is uh, the project together with Open Source College of Germany. Let me look for that agency they're also brilliant days here open oh cool oh, i like it um um when you mentioned the phone uh, i had yesterday a meeting with mnt research they did an open source laptop so oh, that's um, I, I think i saw that i was excited because i've never heard of it 
Yeah, me neither. I, uh, they, they are very bad at marketing, off, um, apparently, because I heard about the, this um, Pine something uh, laptop and a bunch of others. And either they're not open source at all, just yeah, taking the label, or they are very weak laptops and you cannot really work with them. So they combine both and they started with uh, graphic cards for very old computers. And uh, they're the most open source laptop that I've seen so far. You can even the the um, PCB on where the uh, oh. CPU sits um, is open source. They deliver all the all the design files in paper form to the ones ordering the laptop. Oh wow! You think these guys are distributive enterprise material? Um, they are not a distributive enterprise yet. They're not acting alone, but they're well, definitely are they, are they open to it. it? You think they'll be open? They understood the the concept totally. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. no, and they I mean, wanted to build phones and stuff. Um, so that I reminded that reminded me of this um, maker phone. So the case for their the open source laptop, you like it because what? Because they are um, professional. <laughs> That's the most professional open source company I've seen yet. They, I mean, they're capable to design their own graphic cards that work on industrial scale. They prototype in their own lab and then have a supplier chain. Um, they do a lot um, lobbying within the supplier and manufacturer um, network, basically for being able to produce um, their, their own supplies. The stuff Are you that saying they need. that they designed their own graphics cards? Yeah, that's how it started. They started with a graphic card and then they designed the, the other stuff. So so did it work as they used proprietary software to design the card or was it open software too? KeyCut, all KeyCut. KeyCut for a graphics card? Mm-hmm. What's, but not the processor, not, not open silicon, right? Is it um, open silicon? Like... Uh, you mean the, the chips? Chip? Yeah, the chips are not open. Yeah, right? the chips are open. The chips are open. The only chip that is not open is the CPU itself because they are asking for that, but um, it's the most open CPU that you can buy um, as the, the PCB around is open and they're trying to solve that. But all the chips on there, they have also a self-designed chip on the laptops which controls the, the hardware so you can shut down um, specific uh, modules of the laptop or see how, how the batteries are doing and stuff like that and that's all open. What about, well, the, I have, what about I have the LC? Deeply into the design files, it's just I saw a massive GitHub repository where everything is inside and they say this is open, that is open and here look at those files. So I, I trust them. You, you met with them in person or that was a conference? Yesterday. No, yeah, in person. Wow, so these you're saying these guys are they really got it. They they got the culture. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Wow. Okay, that's really impressive. Well, what are they doing for the for the screen? That's just an off the shelf product or good question. Yeah, good question. I don't know if it's a it's a buy part. They say that the um the hinges are not open source. Those are those are buy parts and then a few others. I don't remember what happened with the screen. It was a little smaller than casual laptops. Could be that this is also open source. Don't know. Maybe a bipod too. But you can replace anything in the laptop. That's just using standard it's wherever a, possible. It's a modern laptop. It's fast. Yeah, you can work with it. Um, he himself, the, the CEO, is working with the laptop all day. Wow. OK, I'd, I'd be interested in getting one and starting that. I mean, that would be good. Have you considered getting one of those? or? Uh, well, I have a laptop. I use usually um, um, nah, used laptops. I never buy new products because I want to um, yeah, avoid this waste. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if I would need one, I would definitely buy this one. Yeah, It's um, a little heavier than other laptops because it uses different salts. Um, it, it's um, iron-based salts, so they don't blow up and you can replace them individually. Are you saying they're nickel iron? Not nickel. Is it nickel iron? That can be, yeah. I, I guess no it was way. nickel iron. Because no the nickel iron battery is actually, um, that's in a Global Village construction set as a lifetime design battery. Oh. Interestingly. Um, who's, what's the name of the person there that you talked to? 
Um, Lukas. What's his last name? Lukas. Uh, check that. Lukas. Um, and then, and then just wrote in the mail. And then there's Lukas Venter from the Open. Uh, oh, he, that's an interesting person too. Yeah, yeah, yeah he, he's working on Open Source uh, MRI. Yeah. Okay. That's okay our the friend. fastest way to Lukas is that email address. That is for his secretary. She's pretty fast in responding because Lucas himself is getting a lot of mails. So yeah, um, Lucas they're shipping right now? They, they're selling this? They're sh um, selling, um, officially they're selling prototypes because uh, then they need to do less to nothing for certification and liability. And now they want a Kickstarter campaign and they actually need to ship laptops. So they now need to get the certification stuff. Yeah. Um, very cool. Um, okay. So sad. Is that Lucas or that's his secretary? Uh, the email address is his secretary and his his personal email address because he's usually not so responsive um, to emails. Yeah. But his uh, secretary is. So he's a uh, um, director. I mean, is the whole company? They they pretty much all have the open culture there. They kind of all get it, or. Um, I didn't speak with all the employees, uh, but at least the secretaries um, pretty much into it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, tell me more about, so ROG, do you know the people there, or? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, they're, oh, they're good, yes. Um, so, who's the, it, is there a main person there, or? There are um, two Steven main Kovacs, persons. Or? Steven Kovacs is, um, yeah, is, is one of these main persons. The other one, Susanna, is uh, doing most of the administrative stuff. But Steven is um, the head of almost everything happening there, also this tragedy and things. And he's very much into the open culture, but much more on the uh, human side of things, not so much on the technical side. That's why um, they opened an, an office together with Open Source College Germany to to cover the technical part of it. So we have one office together. You guys have an office for OSE Germany? Yeah. And is that that's Berlin or? What? Yeah, that's also Berlin. Yeah. It's it's what? It's it's also Berlin. Yes. OK. Oh, very good. Huh. Tell me more. So who's behind the, the open source Fab Lab of of Hamburg. Um, that is okay. Benedict, Benedict Seidel. Oh, Benedict um, Seidel. Yeah. Oh, okay. You know him? So they, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, he's building uh, one of our little three D printers. Ah. Open source fab labs. So, okay. So is this the the Helmut Schmidt Military University? Or is that? The <laughs> yeah, I guess it's it's still <laughs> the same. I was pretty surprised that the German military is investing in open source hardware. Um, they invited really me to speak why. there. Yeah, but they're doing ago. it all. <laughs> yeah, um, that's good. Um, so that's the. Oh, okay. So the, so we're talking about Open Lab or whatever Open, whatever they've got there at the university, right? Um, no, that's a new one, as far as I understood it, but it's it's still just um, a proposal. They didn't get any funding yet. Uh -huh. So we were talking about how to shape the funding, how to include the, the Dean spec, and yeah, and see what turns out of that. So what do you think about, I mean, how can we collaborate on, on say, the specification for the open source Fab Lab? Mm-hmm. So um, Fab Labs need, well, I feel that I am not the, the right one to co collaborate on that thing because that's not exactly my domain. And I'm not on the US, so I don't know um, the end users and the the legal constraints too well. But there is the MakerNet Alliance um, that may be interesting for you. 
Maybe one of them. Yeah, yeah. And who would be the person there? Do you know? Nathan. Nathan. Okay. Nathan Parker. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I spoke. He to was the new CEO him. last year. So they're they're interested in the specification for the what the actual machinery system is. I guess they were working on a um, on an open source platform to um, a competence database, basically. So um, he say that yet yeah, people walk into a fab lab and ask for someone who can do this, this and that. So specific engineers and, and deliver jobs. And they thought this process could be formalized and brought to an online platform. And that's what they're doing right now. Um, so they try to connect um, or to make fab labs feasible for casual industry things. So um, this may be in in their scope, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. So also FabLabs could be um, a good model for this distributive enterprise thing because if you're a distributive enterprise, you don't rely on one single product. Yeah. You just rely on your your own interest and your tools. Yeah, yeah, and uh, for the FabLabs. Uh, some of the block is it depends like what their funding model is if they're just supported by grants then mm. they have very little interest in product development uh, something that's economically self-sustaining uh, so there's a block there like there, there's not an alignment of interest between actual economic enterprise versus the education or just uh, the sexiness of it mm -hmm. kind of thing so um, so it would mean finding specific fab labs that are really interested in that and carry that as a mission. I know, like for example, there's in, Insight Focus in Detroit in the United States is a great one mm -hmm. where they're actually working on open source, digitally manufactured housing, little modules for homeless people, for example. Cool. Um, so that's definite potential collaborators there. Um, the lack of interest for development surprises me because they have all the tools. I've been in a makerspace in yeah. Greece, and and they they did um, are they doing open source satellites and are now um, funded for or they, they they earn money by the development that they do together with um, ESA, NASA, and some universities. So they have this makerspace for prototyping um, and this yeah. and the open source products. Um, give them a reference and hence yeah. Yeah, attract funders. Yeah, yeah. I, I've touched base with some of the fab labs, but I mean, a lot of them, um, when you're coming from the education world, your money comes from a different place. And say mm -hmm. you're a teacher, unless you see the greater picture of the distributed economy, uh, that takes away from your time of being a teacher. So there's a fundamental, you can say, a conflict of interest in some way. Like, that's the reason why I would assess, like, say, Neil Gershenfeld. I mean, he's got his hands in high-tech research. For him, he never paid attention to, for example, the concept of you are using the Fab Labs to make real products that are economically significant. It's a lot about individual projects and kind of uh, mm -hmm. learning experience as opposed to this is a viable mechanism for product development. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, he talks about that, but the way it's structured right now does not really align well with that kind of mission. Like, for example, one thing I can point out is, so everyone works on their own project there, right? Well, what if you took made the Fab Academy into a thing where everybody is working on one thing that they actually take to market, something really good? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, but that's that's not in a scope. I can ask, maybe ask Neil if, he, if he's interested in that, but um, I don't think he's... He is particularly interested. Well, could try. Um, Who knows, yeah. We'll see. But that's definitely how I would do it. I mean, just collaborative, the collaborative part. And that's what I mean. Like, a lot of people, uh, the collaborative part, that means you're going out of your way in some way. So culturally, like psychologically, it's a it's a little harder sell to, to collaborate with others. It's, it's, it's just it's a lot a of blocks to collaboration. Uh, that uh, there was um, um, I have a colleague also um, a student of physics and she told me about her um, her last thesis that, that she wrote and she simulated viruses so she wanted to see if um, 
well, if you have a virus that goes through certain mutations, so sort of an evolution. And she wanted to see if these mutations of the virus are more likely to collaborate and thus um, inhabit more mammals or if they compete. And she saw that in the simulation, uh, it depends on the um, population. Mm -hmm. So if you have a small population saying low resources, it's better to compete because when you win land, you, you, you remove it from the others and you have a direct effect in this, in this. And if you have a lot of resources, it's much better to collaborate. So I guess this model is hmm. maybe transformable for the human mindset when we fear that there are low resources like money or stuff on a lot of um, danger out there, yeah. then it's much better to compete and make your land and, and ensure that. And it's also a safe way. That's what we're doing anyway. The, the best um, business model in, in capitalism is based on dependencies. So people need to go to you. But it's, it's also, um, I always ask people, what's the point of your business? Why are you doing what you're doing? What do you actually want to do with that? What's your aim? If your aim is easy profit for low effort, then open source is maybe not your thing. <laughs> but if you're <laughs> but if you're aiming for a problem solution for everybody for for and anywhere in the world so then open source may be a powerful tool for you and then let's make your product feasible for that yeah it's a tool yeah. no that's a good point if you want to solve big problems you have to go open source if you if you're just not really pushing the dial on anything then you're proprietary pretty much i mean it's kind of cr cruel way to say it, but it's really true. If you want to solve bigger problems, you have to go open source. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's also in our culture actually, but nobody really gets it. So um, the whole education system would crush if we have licenses for all the stuff that we have in our books, like ma basic math and stuff like that. It's all open. <laughs> right. Right. For, you know, ah, yeah, and last thing that I wanted yeah. to mention, Kerala. Um, I had a talk with an Indian student um, in Berlin, and he said that he comes from an organization in Kerala, India, where they have open source hardware within the um, educational system. So from very early um, age on, like saying four or five years old, they cannot even, they cannot write, but they can code Arduinos. And, until um, after university, so um, they have the full chain of um, of educational um, things um, brushed up with open source hardware or based on that, and this is to enable them to found their own businesses after university. Really? So, um, what is this organization? Um, need to look up the mail. He sent me some information. Oh, what was his name? So many people. Um, Josh something. Yeah. Okay, I, I will forward it to you. Yeah, if you can't find it, forward it to me. So, um, well, I mean, it's not, that's why I'm saying, like in academia, it's very not common that the teachers actually tell you, here's how you become free by becoming entrepreneurial, starting whatever you want to do. Okay, just found it. I need to copy a mail. Yeah. Who okay. is it? Yeah, so four organizations. Um, I guess there are more. And he has direct contact to a few former colleagues. Yeah, maybe yeah. follow up on that one. Regarding the ventilator, when you said about the collaboration and that, that scheme, who's. Mm -hmm. So are they collaborating there? and? How to get into um, maybe? That, um, I hope so. So I'm not the one who knows the details and they're changing every day. So Robert Reed um, is the one to ask. Uh, maybe I have an old mail from him. Uh, where is he from? From the US, but I don't really know where there. From what organization? Or? Also not quite sure. He's pretty well known in the community. Um, Ventilators? For apparently ventilators and more electronic stuff as well you saying uh, regulators for the ventilators uh or no the 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 uh, ventilators and themselves okay yeah yeah this convention is something yeah that. 
So here's some, some things, and I can also look up the GitHub repository for the ventilator. So he, he um, did a quick research uh, for ventilators and also um, the designs, and then made a table or a spreadsheet where he's assessing how yeah. buildable or active a certain project is. Aha, uh -huh, so that sounds like the open source medical equipment group? Mm, sort of, yeah. Um, I have the resource somewhere here. I am here. So within this GitHub repository, um, he shares how ventilators work. So how how's the basic scheme? How's the skeleton of it? And so it consists of it consists of four major modules and. Um, how this can be done together, and who's doing it, how buildable is it. Huh. Yeah, okay, yeah, I've seen that, um, the ventilator list, I'm kind of following that. It's, it's pretty interesting, because once again, it's a case where all of them should work together to get the one design. Um, mm -hmm. Now, there's coordination loss there, but no, I think altogether we're not designed to collaborate well like that yet. Um, what else? So maybe regarding like a, a good, if, if we talk about distributed enterprises, say we're getting up the open source everything store um, mm -hmm. where people are able to buy products or buy the enterprises, what product in your mind would be the most suitable product outside of ours? Here that people are willing to actually show you how you produce that and they already have that because I think for a lot of products it'd be like we, we have to rework the production engineering to make it easier to build or um, so a product that is proprietary and should be open sourced or an open no. source product that people are willing to learn and open build open source design that people already have so we're starting with something that they're actually yeah. willing to distribute as an enterprise teach others how to do that enterprise that's a good product it's a, something but decent. Pretty much depends on the customer segment and the people and the people's interests. So, with 3D printer is a very good thing to start with because you can build things with it right afterwards, and it's pretty famous. And it's which it's one? Wide. Uh, the 3D printer. Yeah, that's a very good way to start. You can. There are also a million um, different designs of it. I've seen uh, the hang printer a few weeks ago. So, a printer that you can attach to the, yeah, to the yeah. ceiling and then uh, pretty amazing. Yep. Um, and also microcontrollers are good or anything that you can construct microcontrollers with because there's a huge scene behind that and so many things that, think that you can do with microcontrollers. Apart from that, um, well, it depends on which domain your, um, your users act. So, so um, in okay. Kenya, for example, um, microscopes, 3D printable microscope um, was a big thing. Yeah. Okay, um, but for example, for the microcontroller, does somebody make an open source microcontroller that they're willing to teach you outside of Arduino? I mean, Arduino, I don't think they, they're in a business of teaching others how to produce Arduinos, are they? Um, probably not, but is there some, some open source tool chainable, open source producible Arduino that, or not Arduino, but a microcontroller that's a decent one? Because we're actually doing well, that. We're doing a simplistic Arduino-based uh, microcontroller that we're just building ourselves. Could be. Um, there's also a lot of um, development boards and stuff for FPGA. And there's also a bigger community behind that. There's a, a growing interest behind FPGA. Um, as I say, that mainly depends on the people that invite and what they are heading for in the future. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Let's see, I'm looking at MNT <laughs> right now. But let's see, like, where oh, do I okay. find... So, like, their main, like, all their files, keycads, and all that. Uh, where, where do you see that under... Is it under source code? Where's, like, the uh, description of all this, the good uh, marketing copy or anything? The marketing. No, like, uh, uh, d 
do they have a repository of all their hardware? Yes. Um, I accessed it from the from the web page. That's also quite rare because uh, people usually don't share their repository on their web page uh, where they sell stuff. So okay. That's the, they okay. Do. So here's the source, um, and it links to everything that they develop. They also do a lot of coding, and the reform is their actual laptop. So in Sir, there, right, you can mm -hmm. look for um, the PCBs for, ah, even the trackball, cool. Um, they also had a version where you can 3D print on the whole keyboard. Of course, the casing. Uh, they have over here. Yeah. Keyboard. They have an Mother open source yeah. doable keyboard? Um, yeah, they, they now buy the, the keys. Um, but the buttons, but they um, um, their first prototype were with um, that that was all 3D printable, also the casing and including the keys. Um, where do you see those? Like the keyboard, for example. Is that here? Um, keyboard. Could be inside here. Well, I haven't. Not too much. Uh, but sure, but I can I can ask him. Maybe it's not here because this version of the laptop has um, uh, the keys for. But maybe in in an older version, I uh, that's also the master branch. Maybe in an older branch. Yeah, I would need to look that up. But but I saw the laptop. And, yeah. And he did it open source from the beginning, so I'm pretty sure it's somewhere here. But this this laptop doesn't have 3D printable keys because they're heavy and big, and so they try to, and it takes a lot of time to to print them. So he uses universal keys. Yeah. Okay. Any yeah. any more uh, things to discuss? Questions? Yeah. Not, I would just have. I think that's good. Week. I'll take a look at more of the, the laptop see if I can maybe follow up I'd like to really assess like yeah is that something that they would be willing for us to actually produce or to part of their business model is teaching people how to build them to quality control so develop all the all those uh, elements required to do that that's what a distributed enterprise is if they're willing to do that then we'll put them on our website uh, and stuff. Hmm. Well, anyway <laughs> um, no this is really good um, good good to chat and catch up on some things and let's keep the discussion live and uh, we'll be in touch and yeah if you can follow up with like, I think there was a link you were gonna send on or did you send it already on the on the Kerala guys mm -hmm. if you can follow up with that but beyond that yeah we'll, we'll be in touch and keep cool. doing the good work yeah yeah keep it up okay <laughs> Thanks. Nice. Have a good day. Yep, you too. Take care. Bye bye. Ciao.